Appreciate everybody coming out. Looks like we've got a good crowd coming in tonight, so it's awesome. I'm going to start out and go over today's agenda. So, as always, we've got some club announcements that we want to go over. We've got our guest speaker, Cassandra, that's going to be speaking on freshwater plants. And then we've got our species profile from Dave on Curbenzis. And then, of course, we all know our raffle drawing at the end. <clears throat> So some of our club announcements we got going. So we've got our banner contest winner. Uh, Curtis, one of our board members, has got to get up there on top this time. And uh, so it's definitely awesome. You know, be on the lookout for another one going soon. We're looking for new people. We try to try to make it a rule that it has to be a year between each person before somebody wins the banner contest. So a lot of opportunity to get your picture up there. <coughs> we got our March meeting coming up that Rob's gonna be giving on exotic species. That's definitely gonna be one to look out for. And we've got a good success on our open chat messenger. Our chat's been going pretty good. There's some that like it, some that don't, but overall I've seen a lot of activity on there, people talking and just gives a chance for people to just one-on-one -on -one more and not have to have a post to relate to. If you don't know how to turn off the notifications, let one of us know well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cause it can blow you up if you don't. <laughs> All right, and then um, the last part for me is we're looking at getting in some new merch. So we've kind of put the line out there to see what everybody wants and try to take in everybody's opinions. And it's looking like the best thing we want to move forward with next is our hats. Now, <clears throat> this is just a quick model of an ideal to give you what we got going on. It's not going to exactly look like that, but just a picture to let you know that that's going to be our next move. We're going to look to get some hats in. We're definitely excited about that. And we've got a new website we're looking to work on, and with that, I'm going to pass it over and let Mitch tell you a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about the website first. That's just something we're exploring right now. Uh, a lot of clubs of all over the country, they have websites, and I've talked to a few people about the club, and they've asked, what's your website? And I'm like, well, we're on Facebook. Um, so it's just something we're looking at. If anybody has any experience, we want to talk with you, because we want to talk about what our options are and things like that. I've a few of us have built out websites before with uh, different companies, and so we can do that. I just don't want to, I don't want us to do that and invest in it, and then somebody come up and say, hey, I could have helped you do that for free, or, you know, hey, I have the skills to write the HTML. I don't even know if it's still HTML. But anyway, uh, that's out there. If, uh, if, if you can help with that, come talk with, come talk with me or any of the other board members, and we'll, we'll get together on it. Secondly, I did put together a link tree, so you should start seeing these around the stores locally. And um, one thing I would like to ask for you all to do is if you know of a store that you don't see it at, let us know. So, and um, I, we've already spoken with a few people about taking some cards tonight and putting them in the stores. I'd rather we save these cards to put in the stores rather than us all have some um, because the QR code that's on the back, you can download that, or you can take a screenshot or take a picture of it, and you can use that to share with people. So you can pull that QR code up, someone can scan that, it'll take them to our link tree, and they can get everywhere we are online on that page. Um, so it's a really great tool. There is a calendar on there, uh, in the brochure, and I'll, I'll, I've got a couple of ideas of some other documents I'm gonna put on there so that we have access to them. But the brochure that we did at Aquaticon, I updated that, added the new calendar to it, so that's on there. Um, our Facebook group's there, so it's an easy way to get to it. YouTube channel, um, I, and I, I think the Google entry that we have currently is on there as well, so you can get to uh, everywhere we are online through uh, this one QR code. So uh, if you don't have the code yet, let me know. I think it's on the Facebook group still. We'll, we'll pull it up and let you, let you get a screenshot of it. Um, but yeah, the cards, we could use that help. Uh, I've been to, I've been to Aquatic Marine, I've been to JKS. They both have the cards, and I'm going this week, I'm supposed to meet with Sean over at Aquarium. So we've got those three stores already taken care of, um, but any other stores, let us know. And also like pond places this year. I'd like to get it out there too, because they're usually doing fish. <clears throat> next, next slide, right? I know what we're doing. All right. Okay, so the swap is coming up April 8th. It will be at the Fountain City Lions Club again uh, for the third time. Uh, we The entry fee is $2, and then the table fee is $20 for a full table, $10 for a half table. If you've never been to a swap, because before we did it, I've never been to a swap. Um, if you want to have a table, if you got fish or plants or rocks or wood or whatever you would like to bring and sell, $20 gives you a full table, and it's about this size. And aren't they, I think they're like, yeah, it's about right. 
So it's about that size. If you've only got a few things, you're like, I want to make a little spending money before I peruse around, you can do a half table and set up and just sell off your stuff and then go have fun. Um, so there, there's some options there. It is a swap, so you can bring things to trade and stuff, but we do ask, don't bring like a wagon full of stuff to trade and swap. That's not fair to the vendors. We will ask you for $20 or $10 <laughs> in order to make it fair. And we're going to ask you to sit inside because we can't pull take that wagon around. It, it gets pretty busy at times. We did change the hours. Is that on here? No. Typically, we've started early. We're doing 10 to 2, right? The swap will be 10 to 2, so it's a four-hour window. All of you know, get to sleep in a little bit this time. It's because everybody comes for that first hour, if you didn't know. That first hour is all about selection, and the place is packed. So uh, you want to get there at 10 o'clock. If you're going to have a table, we'll have a couple of hours to set up, and we'll have an hour, hour interior. So anything else on the swap? I think that's good. Right. Anything else? No. So with that, we'll uh, pass it over to our speaker, Cassandra. We'll I think her. we have some questions. Oh, Is it oh, strictly fresh water or are we doing salt too? Oh, oh, oh no, no. We can, we can allow salt as long as we get salt uh, Anything people. Anything fish related. Yeah. Yeah, we'd love for some people to do salt water tables. Fish related, art, whatever. Yeah. As long as it's fish related and hobby related. We've had a lot of requests for it. We're just looking for somebody to take the step up and do a salt water table. Uh, we've spoke to a few people about it. I think have some interest, yeah. but of course we don't want to say for sure at this point. We had a point of rain last time with pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will also pool. So, any other questions? All right. So with that, we're going to pass it over to our special guest, Sandra, and let her tell you a little bit about some plants. I chose red, is that okay? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm really excited about this. It's been highly requested. I did a lot of extra research just for you guys. Um, as always, I wrote this presentation specifically for you, knowing that you guys were my audience. Uh, we will be throwing a lot of information out here. I'm not going to be saying everything that's on every slide out loud. I highly recommend that you review the YouTube video. I will also be providing all of the slides um, online as well after the presentation, just so you guys um, don't miss anything. So it's a lot of information, and we're going to get going. Um, first, why bother with plants at all, right? Um, a lot of people just like the way they look, but they're also a little bit safer for fish. If you keep fish with very long, fancy fins like bettas or fancy guppies, things like that, they're a little bit safer than keeping plastic plants. Sometimes they can tear their fins on the plastic plants. They do help absorb ammonia and nitrates to a certain degree. Um, they provide a more natural environment for your fish. Your fish will kind of feel more safe if there's a lot of plant life in there, and of course, if you're breeding or hope to breed, if you have any kind of shrimp or anything else in the tank that's going to breed readily, it provides shelter for your fry. What are we going to expect from this presentation? I'm going to, to go through aquarium science, plant science, from the top down, starting from your lighting, going through every nutrient that you need, all the way down to your substrate. We're going to talk about CO2 injection, filters, water flow, and all of that wonderful stuff. Um, we're going to talk about some common challenges you might face, algae, hitchhikers, how to deal with those things quickly and easily, and at the end I'll give you some advanced strategies, how to get the most red out of your reds, how to do some high tech or low tech or no tech plants, dirt tanks, and then we'll finish up with my own patented strategies. Um, throughout the presentation, there will be some fun tidbits contributed by AI, as I promised on Facebook. I did use ChatGPT to um, spruce up some of these things. So throughout the presentation, you'll see things like this that were all not written by me. Fun poems and limericks and stupid jokes and whatnot that were all written by AI. Feel free to laugh at them because they are very interesting sometimes. What not to expect? We're not going to talk about aquascaping. We're not going to talk about the planting process or specific plants. If you have questions about specific plants, I'm happy to answer them. 
but they're not going to be covered specifically in this presentation. This is going to be more of an overall view of how to grow plants in general. Um, I will be giving the best strategies according to all of the research that I have available to me. By no means is, are these the only way to grow plants. There are maybe thousands of different ways to have success with plants. You can do it in pretty much any environment under any circumstances. There will probably be a plant that will thrive in your circumstances. These are just the best ways. So, aquarium science from the top down, what are we gonna be doing? We're gonna be doing water, parameters, lighting, fertilizers, filters, flow, CO2, substrate, and plant selection at the end. Just a little bit of plant selection. Getting right down to it with lighting. Uh, this is an odd color that was not in my presentation originally, but that's fine. Uh, can anybody tell me what light actually does for a plant? Provides photosynthesis. It, yes, it enables photosynthesis. It causes the plant to want to grow. So you're not going to be doing anything without light. And when you're designing a tank or thinking about doing plants in your tank, your lighting is going to dictate everything else that happens. How much photosynthesis is your plant going to want to achieve? And then you give them the nutrients and the CO2 and everything else available to do that. So when we're talking about lighting, and how much lighting to give to our plants, we're going to talk about something called PAR. And this is, again, not what I wrote in my presentation. This is fun. Um, so I actually did this. I, I ran through this twice at, uh, at home. Everything was fine. But of course, now that we're live on, uh, on JT's laptop here, everything's different. We'll roll with it. We're going to be talking about PAR. What is PAR? It's photosynthetic active radiation. That is the amount, or it's a measurement of how much light the plants absorb from the plant's perspective. What we used to do, um, for those of you who have been in the hobby for a while, we used to talk about things like watts per gallon when it came to lighting. We used to talk about lumens, and if you're a really old timer, um, like I kind of am, um, we used to talk about things called foot candles. Um, and these are all measurements for our human eyes and some of them are energy, uh, watts per gallon is just an energy output. So these things aren't as accurate as, a, uh, as PAR. The PAR is now the best way that we know of to measure the actual potential that a light has to give to a plant. And we've got some ratings here. Um, if you've ever seen, if you ever look up, um, <clears throat> sometimes it has them on the box from the manufacturer, they'll have the PAR ratings there. Or sometimes you can just Google them. Some people have taken it upon themselves to measure them with a PAR meter um, and put the, um, the actual ratings online. So you can look up what is low light or what is high light. Is this, is this um, light going to give me 80 PAR at whatever it measured it at? Which is uh, the next best thing. Oh, we'll get to it after this. Um, we also used to talk about Kelvin color spectrum. These are no longer as important. Um, there are many, many different ways to get your hands on a plant-specific light, um, from cheap lights to very expensive lights. As long as you're buying something made for growing plants, you don't have to worry about Kelvin or color, color spectrum. Um, if you want the science on it, uh, NASA did this big, huge study on what kind of lights grow plants the best. They decided that 660 nanometer hyper-red LEDs were the best for vegetative growth uh, with your 450 nanometer for deep blue for flowering. Uh, if you've ever seen specific uh, LED lights to grow plants, they have this mixture and you get a nice gross purple color look. But what we usually do is we usually throw in, throw in a little bit of green and maybe a little bit of a white channel and that looks better to our eyes and also helps grow plants. But if you want the best kind of light, you're going to want to look for something that has these 660 nanometer hyper-red LEDs built into the light itself. Back to PAR ratings. Um, so, my lovely paint drawings, my Microsoft paint drawings. Um, when you get a PAR measurement on the box, right, it might say, this light puts out 80 PAR. Well, that's not the entire story. Usually manufacturers measure PAR in the air, and they usually measure it just a couple inches from the light itself. <clears throat> when you go through water, 
you're going to lose par very quickly. Every six inches or so, you're going to lose about 50% of your par rating. So your 80 par up here at the top will grow some nice reds in your plants. But six inches down, you're going to stop seeing those reds, and you're just going to see some nice greens. And then six inches down, depending on how deep your tank is, if you get down to eight, 18 inches down at the substrate, if you've got a 55-gallon or larger tank, you're going to be looking at maybe 20 or so par. That's going back to our chart before, that's low light. So you just have to keep these things in mind when you're choosing and selecting a light. You're also gonna lose some par depending on the angles that you plant at. Over here, this is my lovely top-down view that I did with Microsoft Paint. Um, so this is assuming you have a bar light that you put in the center of your tank. If you plant right near the light, you're going to get the highest amount of par. If you plant towards the back or towards the front, you're going to get a lower amount. So if you're planning on your planting process and you want to put these beautiful, nice, high-demand stem plants in the back, you just have to keep in mind you're not going to be getting the full amount of par. Likewise, in the corners, these are going to be your lowest par areas. So you want to make sure that the plants that you put in the corners are not your high-demand highlight plants. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to shout them out. There will be a section at the end. Um, I may ask you to hold your question till the end or to a next session. But if you have anything that you want to say, go ahead and shout them out. Um, we're going to plow right along into water parameters. Um, talk about water parameters for a planted tank. We're really only concerned about three things, mainly two things. And that's going to be GH and KH, your general hardness, your carbonate hardness. These are measurements of things in your water. General hardness is your calcium and your magnesium. Carbonate hardness would be carbonates and bicarbonates. Um, this acts as a buffer to your pH. If your KH is low, your pH may swing up and down. It may not be controlled very well. If your KH is high, your pH may not adjust very well depending on what you're doing with it. Um, before I move on, does anybody know what pH actually stands for? Hydrogen. Potential hydrogen. Oh. Close, close. So the perfect parameters, according to all the pros and experts and what we talk about, again, there are a million different ways to grow plants, but if you want the best of the best, you're going to want to shoot for a GH and KH of four. This provides a good balance of calcium and magnesium in the water without being too hard. And it gives you a little bit of a buffer to your pH without having too much of a buffer in case we need to change things or start injecting CO2, which we'll get to later. So most of us around here, uh, I know there's a, a lot of different water types out of our tap, but most people, because a lot of this area is built on lime mines, we mostly have hard water here. So if you have hard water above GH and KH of 4, Yes, your plants, most of them can adjust. But if you want to bring them down, what you're going to want to do is get RODI water, reverse osmosis deionized water. Um, that is water with absolutely nothing in it at all. And what you can do from there is either remineralize it, or you can mix it back with your tap water to get back to a GH and KH of four. Likewise, some of you are blessed with soft water, and I'm very jealous of uh, you, Dave. Um, well, I'm paying for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if your water is too soft, you can again remineralize. You can either adjust your uh, GH and KH individually. Um, GH, you can use something, a product called Seachem Equilibrium. And for KH, you can use plain old baking soda. If you want to use both, the, or if you want to raise both at the same time, you can use crushed coral or a product called Salty Shrimp GH KH Plus. Um, it's available online. Um, but again, most plants will adapt to other water parameters, and it is usually best to do what's best for your livestock, unless you're keeping a plant-only tank and specializing just in plants. Do what's best for your fish, do what's best for your shrimp, and do what's best for you, because constantly messing with your water parameters can be a hassle, and it is best to have a stable environment than try to constantly achieve a pristine environment and not hit it. Finally, always test your source, your source water. You want to know what you're putting in your tank. A lot of the water, especially around here, because we've had a lot of runoff from agriculture, 
A lot of the tap water here, source water here, has nitrates already in it, sometimes ammonia already in it. You want to know what you're putting in your tank just so you don't overdo something. For instance, last week, Knoxville's water went up almost 0.6, and my, my pH was at 8.2 all last week, and two weeks before it was 7.4. Yes. And my the hardiness was crazy high, too. Yeah. 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 And, it, and, it, and it can change. So it will change. Check it out. Very odd. Yeah. It'll yeah. you know, change when there's storms, and there's a bunch of water that gets pushed into the system, too. It will also change seasonally. They will do pulses, uh, what they call superchlorination <clears throat> pulses where they put out a whole bunch of chlorine through the lines, more than you're usually used to dealing with in your tank. So it's always also better just not to get off on a tangent here about tap water, but uh, it's usually better to overdose your dechlorinator to three to five times. It's perfectly safe to overdose your dechlorinator. Um, moving on. <laughs> um, fertilizers. Who here is using any of these fertilizers? API leaf zone, C chem flourish. API leaf zone. API leaf zone. What's the point? All it has in it is potassium iron. We're going to see in a second every nutrient that plants need, but I can tell you this it is much more than potassium and iron. C chem flourish is mostly water. We're going to have a chart in a little bit. You can see for yourself if you can read it on this, uh, on this screen here. C chem flourish is about 2% nutrients, 98% dilution. And Excel is marketed as liquid uh, CO2, which does not exist except in a pressurized state in a pressurized specialized CO2 canister. Uh, it's actually just an algicide. And this is a fun little quote from AI right here. And some plants are sensitive to Excel and will actually kill them. Yes, yes. Well, it's glutaraldehyde. It's an algicide. So you have to take care whenever you use something that's intended to, to kill plant life of some kind. Simple plants. No, mosses. Anything that's a, a soft leaf kind of plant will be very sensitive to these things. So what all do plants need? We, when we talk about nutrients that plants need, we talk about micronutrients versus macronutrients. And this is just a way of saying macronutrients you need a lot of, and micronutrients you don't need so much of. I'm not going to get into every nutrient, what every nutrient does, but these are the three main things that people talk about, nitrogen. Nitrogen exists in many forms in our tank. We already know this because of the nitrogen cycle, right? We know about ammonia and how ammonia turns into nitrate and how nitrite turns into nitrate. These are all forms of nitrogen that plants can use to grow. Back to what I said before, always test your water. Make sure you're not putting too much nitrogen in your water. We'll learn soon, too much of any one thing is going to cause an imbalance, which will lead to algae. This is the list of micronutrients that plants need in order to grow. <clears throat> this is why I do not recommend using something like an API leaf zone. This is why I recommend reading the bottle of fertilizer in your hand before you decide on what you're going to use. There is a, uh, a we call this a law, we call this Liebig's principle or Liebig's law of the minimum. What is this? This dictates the growth of a plant is limited by the availability of the nutrient that is the shortest supply. What's that mean? That means if there is any one thing that your plant does not have, it's gonna stop growing. When your plants stop growing, algae starts growing. You wanna make sure you're providing everything that your plant needs all of the time so that they're out competing algae. We use this little barrel here to kind of illustrate this. So every little stage in this barrel indicates a different nutrient. And if any one of them is missing, all your water's going for it. It's like if any one of your nutrients is not in abundance, your plants aren't going to grow. You're going to have algae. That's a lot of stuff, though, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we got this covered. There is something called the estimated index, or the EI method. This is basically where you flood your tank with nutrients up to a certain amount. So you're giving the plants everything, all of the time, so that you know nothing is missing. When you use the EI method, we usually purchase um, prepackaged salts online with instructions that come with dosing and mixing. So you know exactly what combinations you should get, you should achieve. Because everything has a different amount that it should be. You're, like I said, micronutrients and macronutrients. 
you don't want more nitrogen, phosphates, and uh, phosphorus, uh, and potassium, sorry, that uh, you would want of any of the micronutrients. The advantages that this has is that it's customizable. Because you can mix it yourself, you can leave out something. If your tap water has too much nitrogen in it already, you can leave out the nitrate, and you can just have everything else in it. If you test your water and it's very high in phosphates, like mine is, 80 ppm out of the tap water, that's high. You can leave out the phosphates. You can leave out that in your EI mix. You can also buy, um, there is one product, we'll see here in a second on this comparison chart. I don't know how easy this is to read for y'all. This is a comparison of most of the popular fertilizers. There are not many that hit every point. In fact, there's only one, and it's Seachem Flourish. But if you look over here, you can see 2%. It's only got 2%. It's a bottle of water with a couple drops of fertilizer in it. The next best thing on the market right now is Thrive, uh, the Nylock G-Line. Um, the uh, Aquarium Co-op Easy Green is another decent choice. It, it, it's missing a couple things, so there's no calcium inside Co-op Easy Green. Uh, so if your water is very soft and you're trying to give your plants everything they need, that might not be the best choice for you because it doesn't have any calcium. The last thing when we're talking about nutrients is water changes. You're dumping all of the nutrients that the plants need every single day into your tank. Six days a week. On day seven, you do a 50% water change. This is completely necessary to make sure there is no excess buildup of any one nutrient. Again, everything is, needs to be kept in a balance. We need to be constantly restoring the balance if we're adding all of this stuff into our tank constantly. 50% or more at least once a week. So now we're going to get into filters and flow. Does anybody know the optimal flow rate for a planted tank? I think it's going to surprise some of you. Ten times an hour. It means you need to turn over the entire capacity of your tank 10 times an hour. If you've got a 50 gallon tank, that means you need 500 gallon per hour filtration. That's a lot of flow. Doesn't necessarily have to be achieved in one filter. You can add power heads to help this, um, especially if you have a very long tank. Adequate flow helps prevent algae and dead spots. So we're adding all this nutrient rich water Right? We want to make sure that the water can get around to every plant because, again, if your plant doesn't have all these nutrients, it's going to stop growing and that's going to lead to algae. You don't want that. You want to make sure that the water is constantly circulating. There are also some forms of algae that prefer being in stagnant water. Uh, green dust algae, green spot algae is one of these culprits. Um, having an adequate flow will help prevent these. Next, we'll talk about filters. So filters provide some uh, different options depending on what kind of filter you have. We're going to get to what the best filter is in a second for a planted tank. But the main job of the filter is to remove waste, is to convert ammonia to nitrate, because even if you only have plants in your tank, you're still going to have ammonia because plants die, plants break down, and when they break down, they break down into ammonia and to some other things. And you will inevitably have that nitrogen cycle. You can't stop the nitrogen cycle. You will eventually have your ammonia convert into nitrate, and you want a place to have that happen. You also have the option in some filters for a chemical filtration. So if you're going to add something like carbon to your tank, if you um, have any medicines that need to be taken out of the tank, if you're doing any kind of adjustment of your water parameters, so say you want to add a crushed coral to your tank, but you don't want to use it as a substrate because you don't like the way it looks, you can stick that in your filter if you're using the right filter. And what is the right filter? Well, the best filter for a planted tank is going to be your canister filter. 
a second, close second is going to be a sum. And why is that? First of all, because you can customize them to anything you want. You can add extra filter floss to have your water nice and polished and looking clear and gorgeous. They provide a large volume so that you have room for these custom changes. Uh, something like a hang on back filter, while you could open it up and customize it to a certain degree, they're very small containers usually. They don't provide that much room. Both canisters and subs will also give you a high flow rate. The advantage that canisters will have is that they um, have less surface agitation. That's important for injecting CO2, which we will get to in a minute. Um, but the more surface agitation you have, the more CO2 you will lose. That's why a canister has a slight advantage over a sump in a planted tank. And this should go without saying, because based on what I just said, you probably shouldn't use a sponge filter <coughs> in a planted tank because it wouldn't provide the best flow rate and the best turnover. And now everybody's favorite CO2. I know a lot of people find this very daunting, but it's really not. It's actually very easy. It is, of course, possible, like I've been saying all along, it's possible to do plants without CO2. It's possible to do plants any kind of way. If you want the best growth, you need to be injecting CO2. If you don't, it may lead to problems, especially if, you have a high, if you're trying to have a high light environment without CO2 injection, or if you have high demand plants without the CO2 injection, <coughs> you're going to have some issues. Usually, black beard algae, it's a big one that comes up. Um, sometimes staghorn algae, sometimes you'll just see stomach growth or pore growth. This is my CO2 setup at home. Um, I have a pressurized cylinder. This is a 20 pound cylinder from Holston Gases. This is down on Baxter, down here in downtown Knoxville. There's another one in Morristown. Um, this is connected to a dual stage regulator. And what the regulator does is take the pressure down. So this cylinder is very, very high pressure. If you were to unleash this on your tank, you would probably not have any water in it because they're so, it would shoot out so hard. Um, the regulator, you want to take it down to about 50, 30 to 50 PSI is a good flow rate for your tank. Um, you can get an optional, what they call solenoid. The solenoid hooks up to the electrical outlet and it turns the regulator on and off. You can put this on a timer. Some people like to turn the CO2 off at night to avoid pH swings or to save CO2. I don't personally do that, but it is an option. Um, and I have a six-way splitter attached to mine. Uh, the important thing here is the CO2 tubing. This is a specialized tubing. You don't want to use airline tubing in your CO2. Regular airline tubing, you're going to lose about 50% of the CO2 you inject through the walls of the plastic just because that's the way the molecule works. You want to use something specifically used for CO2 to avoid those leaks. After I switched, I used to swap out my tank, the 20 pound tank. It used to last me about three or four months on regular airline tubing. I switched to CO2 tubing and I have not changed that in over a year. I never had to. It is still at least halfway full. There are some alternative ways to get CO2 into your tank that I'm not going to talk about. They do exist. Um, a lot of these are viable options, especially if you have a smaller tank. The ink ball canister method um, especially is a very good one if you have a small size tank or a nano tank that you're trying to inject stuff in. Um, what I did not talk about was the diffusers in this. Um, let's go back here. You can't actually see it, but I do have a little bit of a, a blurb about it. So also essential is how you inject the CO2 into your tank. Right? Because CO2 is going to be a gas, and because it's a gas, it's going to want to float up to the top of your tank and escape. It doesn't really help us. So we use these things called diffusers. They're basically like a little air stone that breaks up the one bubble into a bunch of smaller bubbles. And your goal is for, by the time the bubbles reach the top, that they've completely dissolved in the water. That doesn't usually work if you have a big tank or if you're fighting against hard water with a high cage buffer where you need to inject more and more CO2. Diffusers can quickly get overwhelmed. That's why sometimes people will use a reactor. The reactor is very similar, except it will trap the CO2 bubble inside until it has dissolved, and then the um, CO2-rich water will go out of the tank. What I personally do is something that 
Um, people on the internet argue with me about constantly, because they tell me I'm going to kill everything, is inject this directly into my canister intake. I have this CO2 tubing going directly into the intake of my canister filter. It travels into my canister filter, gets broken up by the impeller, and by the time the water comes out of the filter, the CO2 is completely dissolved. I think it's a very easy way to do CO2 injection, despite the fact that apparently my fish should be dead based on what people on the internet have to say. How do you do that mechanically speaking? How do you, how do you run that into your cans? So I have a, uh, on all of my canister intakes, I have a pre-filter sponge. So this is just a sponge that I cut a hole in, I slip it over the intake, and I stick the CO2 tube into the sponge right next to it and just use the sponge to hold it in place. And the suction from the canister filter sucks the balls right up. I've been, I've been looking at the reactors and yeah. the inline. Yes, the inline reactors are really nice. Uh, and, well, they have, I, I have my systems from Great Okay. Okay, and they have an inline where it just goes into the line that goes into the aquarium. It's like a little T yep. where the um, CO2 line goes into that, and then they have a little like reactor where it it swirls Spins. the little bubble into like then, a spiral. And then I've seen others that have like an impeller. I've watched yeah. a lot of YouTube videos. What is the best choice? I have, it's going to be on a, a 60 and a 55. I think whatever choice is whatever thing works best for you. The end goal is the CO2 has to be dissolved completely at the end of the day. If it's not dissolved completely by the time it leaves the reactor, that reactor is not good enough. So just a, just a straight inline one would work Straight probably. inline one would, would be the way I would go, if you're not going to do it directly into the canister. Okay. Tia, Yes, um, could you do direct inline into a protein skimmer output? Like if you moved it on the outside? I don't know, I've never used one. Okay, sorry. But again, the end goal, just theorizing here, the end goal is to have all of the, uh, all of the CO2 bubbles dissolved by the time they reach the surface of the tank. So if injecting into a protein skimmer achieves that, then that would be a completely fine way to do it. So now we know how to inject CO2. How do we know how much CO2 to inject? There are a couple different ways here. What I'm going to tell you not to do is to not rely on a drop checker. I don't have a picture of one, unfortunately, but the drop checkers are these little bulbs that you see sometimes filled with green or blue liquid that's supposed to tell you how much CO2 is in your tank. They are not accurate. They sometimes take up to an hour or more to change. And depending on your water chemistry, they may not work at all. Um, that's why we, what we do is we rely on the pH drop method or the chart method. Um, they both rely on you testing your pH. And I recommend for this process, you get an accurate pH uh, meter. This, I got this thing for three bucks off of Amazon. Yes, it requires calibration. Yes, it requires calibration sometimes, often. No, it does not tell you when it needs to be recalibrated. You just have to do it. Um, but it's quick and easy, and it's a lot more accurate than a liquid test. For this purpose, we want to take a measurement of your pH before you start injecting CO2, before the lights turn on. That's going to be your baseline. We'll use this picture as an example. Say my baseline is 7.72 before the lights turn on, before I start injecting CO2. What I want to do is start injecting CO2, start off slowly, and take another measurement a little while later, about an hour or so after the lights turn on. And I want to aim for that pH level to drop one full point down to 6.72. That will tell me that I have the optimal level of CO2, which is 30 parts per million. You can also measure your pH and KH and adjust. There's little charts that you can look up online that will tell you if your pH is this and your KH is this, and this is an estimate of how much CO2 you will have in your tank. Those things will also get you fairly close. But both of them are better than the drop checker. Moving on to substrate. So substrate does two things in our tank, right? It holds down the roots of the tank. What a lot of people don't think about is that it's also responsible for delivering nutrients to the roots of your plants. So very briefly, 
How deep should you go? I recommend about two to four inches. You can go a little bit deeper if you want. You could be inviting a bad time if you do that. Just know that you will have more debris to clean up. You may be inviting anoxic conditions, which could lead to hydrogen sulfide buildup if you don't take care of it properly. Two to four inches is a good way. I like to slope mine one way or the other towards the filter uh, inlet or towards the front of the tank or perhaps towards the corner to encourage the debris to kind of roll downhill and make it a little bit easier to clean. But the big thing here is delivering nutrients. This wonderful, wonderful square here. Um, <laughs> when we talk about delivering nutrients to the roots, of our plants, we talk about something called CEC, cation exchange capacity, and I'm not going to go into this very much. I'm just going to give you a list of ratings here to show you what is good and what is not so good. Make your own decisions here. Um, we will be getting um, into dirt and clay later, but <coughs> We want the best of the best, and the best of the best, according to this chart, and according to what we have available right now, is aqua soil. The advantage that aqua soil has over dirt is that it can be exposed to the water column. Dirt cannot be exposed to the water column. And what we're going to do here is we're not going to shove a bunch of root taps in the substrate. And we're not going to rely on dirt for however long the dirt is going to last, and however long the nutrients in that dirt is going to last, even though it could be years. What we're going to do is use an aqua soil with a high CEC, and what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to take the fertilizer out of the water column, and it's going to hold it in the substrate, and it's going to deliver those nutrients directly to the roots. That way you never have to mess with the root tab. You don't have to worry about... Yes, if you want to deliver nutrients directly to your roots, using root tabs is definitely the way to go. If, um, if you're not using an aqua soil, or if you don't have direct access to the water column because you're using dirt. You can stuff your, if you're using a dirt tank or a dirt as your substrate, you can stuff the dirt full of root tabs and that will help deliver nutrients for the, um, for the roots of plants. Now very briefly, what you want to do with your tank when you're designing your strategy is to have a mix of different kinds of plants. That is to say, you want some plants that are feeding very heavily from the substrate, some heavy root feeders like a crypt or some Amazons, uh, Amazon swords. Uh, you want some fast growing plants, stem plants, floaters, something to absorb very quickly excess nutrients if you happen to go overboard. And you want some epiphytes, some mosses, some um, anubias, uh, boost phalandra, something that's going to take the nutrients again directly from the water column. We're doing pretty good. Nobody fell asleep yet. <laughs> We're almost to the end, I promise. Real quick, the most common things that people face in planting tanks are always going to be algae and hitchhikers. You're going to want to get some plants online from somewhere. You're going to come to a fish meeting and you're going to get this cute little plant that's going to be full of snails and scuds and black hair <laughs> algae and what have you. How do you deal with this stuff? Well, it's real easy. Um, there's two different types of algicide that I would recommend. Again, you have to be careful when you use algicide if you're going to be using algicide in your tank. If this is mostly intended for a quick fix, if you got a plant that was infected with something, or if you know you went on vacation like I did for a little while and neglected your tanks and you come home with some hair algae, it's perfectly fine to use some algicide every once in a while. These are the kinds I recommend: blue aldehyde for black hair algae, black beard algae, or your staghorn and then epoxy aldehydes for any other type of algae, your green spot algae, your hair algae, and things like that. If you want to be on the safe side, before you put any kind of plant in your tank, you should give it a dip to make sure it doesn't have any hitchhikers on it. Bleach dip or an alum dip. Uh, this is aluminum sulfate. This is, um, you can find it in the canning section. If you, can't, if you don't know what it is, if you can't find it, ask your grandma. I'm sure she knows what it is. Mm. Um, but before we get on to the advanced strategies, does it, has anybody here experienced some kind of challenge or something in their own tank or have anything here at this point that they need to bring up or want to ask a question about? I've, I've noticed with my tanks, I have the two tanks I had algae problems 
the 55 had the hair algae problem, yeah. and the 29 had the glass kind of algae problem. Right? The, the, the dust. The yeah. Dust, yeah, and ever since I started doing the, I was doing a lot of the flourish and stuff like that, the yeah. fertilizers, sure. and once I started with the uh, CO2, I, I don't have any any algae problems in any of the tanks. There you go, because the CO2 was a limiting factor. Just like everything else has to be in balance. If something is not there, your plants are going to stop growing, and when your plants stop growing, algae starts growing. See, mine are, I, I have to keep clipping them once a week to yeah. keep them from oh. That's it. That's the bad part about having a greatly balanced tank. So you've got to maintain it. You've got to prove it constantly. All the fish have little smiles on their faces. <laughs> I just think, too, though, that like, some algae is good if you keep shrimp. Oh, yeah. Algae is by no means bad. Yeah, I'm not saying, I've never said algae like, was bad. Your, no, 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 no. I've just seen it all on the internet. And they're like, how do I get rid of the algae? And it's like, you don't need to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if you don't want to get rid of your algae, don't. This is my shrimp tank. I, I only have algae in this tank because I have shrimp, because I encourage it to grow. Because of the shrimp love it. It's that's, a great food source. That's what I did, was I took some of the hair algae and I put it in the shrimp tank and it kind of helped it. Perfect. So the glutaraldehyde is the flourishing cell, but yes. what's the epoxy aldehyde? Epoxy aldehydes, so um, the only product I can think of off the top of my head is APT Fix. Um, but again, it's, it's a, this one is actually a very mild algicide. Um, there are some out there, like, you can buy stuff at uh, the local stores here made for ponds and whatnot that will eradicate anything, including all of the fish. Mm. Um, but epoxy aldehydes are a little bit safer, in my opinion, than in my experience. But I can't name off the top of my head, off the top of my head any other product that has epoxy aldehydes in it besides APT Flourish. Okay. Or APT Fix, excuse me. So if, if one, if me, if I, if I had, like, a heavily thin tank and then I have... And then I, I have been using Flourish Excel to, to embattle some algae, but then I'm like, this isn't working as well, so I stopped using that for months. And now I have some green spot algae on the tank, and then in the spray bar that I'm dealing with. Yeah. And I'm still having a lot of plant growth. How might I deal with that? You, if you wanted to, you could use APT Fix or something like, uh, in a, another product that has epoxy aldehydes in it. It would be perfectly acceptable. You, it's something that you can dose every day in your tank um, if you want to. Or you could try to adjust any kind of flow issues you may have that may be attributing to the green dust algae here. Yeah. But if you want to pick an easy fix, definitely definitely the epoxy aldehyde is the way to go. Question. Yes. Sand, sand substrate, and I'm putting Thrive root tabs in the sand, but also dosing water column with Thrive. Yes. Am I at risk of any kind of absorption in the sand? From the water column where I would be over no. dose. No, because the sand is inert, it's okay. not going to transfer those okay. nutrients. Okay. It's not going to be able to absorb the nutrients in order to transfer them. And um, likewise, you should be mindful when you use an inert substrate like sand and you're using root tabs, that your root tabs don't magically grant the rest of the sand the ability to provide nutrients. It's only going to be in that one spot where you put that root tab. Yeah. And I typically put them where my, you know, like crip stuff, the stuff that needs that, yes. that root growth versus the other stuff that's been water column. Directly under your heavy root feeders, or if you're trying to grow a carpet, put it where the carpet is not to encourage the roots to, so, to go over there. What, what if my carpet is thoroughly covered now? Well, then you're good. You don't need to be asking okay. questions. <laughs> so we're <laughs> some advanced strategies to wrap this up here. And we're going to learn how to get the rest of the reds. Uh, we're going to talk about nitrate starvation. And to achieve that, we're going to talk about no tech, low tech, and some dirted tanks. And here is a little bit of a horror story written by AI. You can read that later if you haven't already. It's intriguing. Um, how do you get the reds out of your reds? If you go on the internet, a lot of people are going to tell you you need to pump them full of iron. Pump them full of iron, just dose of iron. You're going to get red, but it's not true. Redness in plants is caused by uh, um, anthocyanins. These are a pigment that grows in plants naturally. 
iron is required for the uh, for anthocyanins to um, to form, but any any iron in excess of the minimum required is not going to make your plants any redder. What's going to make your plants redder is strong light. Um, so the redness in plants is kind of likened sometimes to a sunburn. If a plant spends too much time in the sun, it turns red, basically. We can also help achieve this on some plants. This doesn't work for all plants, but for some plants, what we can do is we can do something called nitri uh, nitrate starvation or nitrogen starvation. This is where you intentionally do not dose one of the three essential macronutrients, nitrate, in order to stunt the growth of your plant. What that does is that it slows down cell formation so that these, the individual plant cells are exposed to light for a longer time before they start growing more, which turns them more red. You expose it to more light slowly, it turns them more red. Again, this does not work for every plant. Um, a good plant that this will work with, if you want to experiment with it, um, it will happen pretty quickly, are red root floaters. If you nitrate starve red root floaters, they will turn very, very red or purple. If you feed them lots of nitrate, they will turn green. So lastly here, low tech, no tech, dirt tanks. Dirt tanks I consider an advanced strategy for a couple different reasons, because dirt is so full of nutrients, it cannot be exposed to the water column. You have to cap it with sand or with some very fine gravel so that it doesn't explode into a nitrogen green algae mess. This also means that you can't reconstitute your dirt or reconstitute your substrate using a liquid fertilizer. This means you have to think about things in advance when you're thinking about things like how do I make sure all of my plants are getting everything they need. Yes, your root, your root plants, your root feeders are covered by the dirt, but your epiphytes and your mosses and everything else are not. Low tech and no tech are perfectly viable options. Like I've been saying all along, you can get away without any of this stuff. You can put a tank without a light in a windowsill with some dirt on the bottom capped with sand and you can grow plants very well. It's called the wall stab method. There's nothing wrong with that. But I know how much people here like to complain. I know what you're all thinking. I see the looks on your faces. This is a lot of stuff, Cassandra. You just spent an hour rambling about all this science crap. Give me the secrets. These are my secrets for success. You want to hit the ground running with a planted tank that can grow most things, maybe not everything, but definitely some nice reds, some lush forest garden with a carpet in the bottom and everything. You want to get yourself a nice programmable medium to high light with a, a par around 80 measured through water, not measured through air. Don't mess with your water chemistry. Use your regular tap water. Find plants that will adjust to your water. Don't try to make your water adjust to your plants. It may take some trial and error. It will take some patience. Use proper CO2 injection with a pressurized CO2 cylinder. I don't recommend doing a do-it-yourself method. I don't recommend trying to do a highlight tank without a CO2. Definitely use a mixture of all different kinds of plants. Remember heavy root, heavy root feeders? Heavy uh, fast growers, floaters, or stem plants, and column feeders at the fights and mosses. Make sure you get some aqua soil, three to four inches deep. And I'll be small talk. Anybody else? Like to yes? It's more of just kind of an add on. Uh, one of the things that really, really helped me, I always struggled with fresh water, or pretty good, I suck at fresh water, but good at salt was doing the, uh, there's a test you can do, an ICP test. It analyzes your water for almost every single nutrient in it. I've not heard of this. It's awesome. Uh, it's a mass spectrometer <laughs> test. Oh, okay. Except for it's $15. Okay. Yeah. Where do I sign up? You can buy them online, and they have source water, um, which you can do your RODI and see what's coming out, because zero TDS does not mean it's clean. I found that far away. Yes. Um, they have a freshwater one that's going to break down everything from iron three, iron two, raw iron, sulfates, all of it, as well as a saltwater one. And it turns out all of my issues with freshwater was because of these dissolved nutrients that I was not tested for. Nice. So um, those things are awesome. They're $15. If you want to get the super crazy fancy one, I think it's like 
45. And it's called an ICP test? ICP test, okay. yeah. And they have an app, actually, too, that you can, they mail you, the, you can either mail the resorts or it's upload to the app, and the app will track everything going on in your state and recommend your products. Very cool. So if you're looking for the trace nutrients and you're not trying to do all kinds of crazy stuff, that was really helpful for me. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. ICP test. So was your sands that are inert and not absorbable, obviously. Yes. Uh, do you ever recommend like putting down like uh, like a lat right or something that underneath that and capping that? You with could. The sand too? Yeah, like I said, there's a thousand different ways to do this. If you want to uh, use an inert substrate and jack it full of nutrients and root tabs and laterites and whatever you want to do, that's perfectly acceptable. You can have great success with that for sure. Laterite is a great thing to use, especially with an inert substrate. Is that your cat? That is one of my cats, yes. What's his name? This is Minou. 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 Minou is one of the many French words that means cat. <laughs> yes. So, of course, the thing everybody knows, I'm kind of a lazy keeper. I don't do all lot of fancy stuff. Sure. But up and down, my tank's bad, and I'll consider maybe doing more than high tech tank, just to it. Yeah. Um, I know you have to cap the dirty tanks, but if you watch YouTube videos, even the aqua store, it always seems like they always cap it. You always have to cap aqua soil. Don't do that. Never cap an aqua soil. It defeats the purpose. The purpose of the aqua soil is to be exposed to the water column so that it can absorb the nutrients from your fertilizers. Never cap an aqua soil. You can mix it. You can mix it if you want. Don't cap it. I think it's just aesthetics. It'll just cover it because yeah. I don't know if it's going to be better. And, yeah. um, is there any suggested aqua soil that you prefer? Or? Doesn't matter. They're all pretty much the same. It's pretty much just clay particles mixed with some rocks and dirt. And a lot of them will just decompose over time, so you'll have to replace it every couple of years. Okay. Anybody else? Fluval stratum is not aqua soil, right? Fluval stratum is not aqua soil, right? I don't know. I'm not familiar with the product. Okay. I don't believe it's so. I don't believe so. Okay. If, if it's not, it should be little round black balls if it's aqua soil. All, all aqua soil looks like that, okay. uh, black or brownish. It's pretty close to it. It's not exact. It's not technically called an aqua soil, but it's, it's, it serves the same purpose, but it doesn't make the mess. That's why I like to use Google Strap because of that right there. Yes. It's a little cleaner. It doesn't have as high as a cationic exchange. I think it's 30 instead of 40. Very close. I had an issue with it because we have really soft water. Yeah. And the fluid stratum is making the pH go even lower. Oh, yeah. That's so. a thing to remember about some of these substrates. But they'll, out of the bags, they'll release ammonia usually. Um, that will go away. And so will any kind of cloudiness or anything else in it. That'll go away with water changes. But yeah, at first, if you've got soft water, look out. That will you know, crash your pH real quick. Anything else? All right, cool. Great. That we're gonna turn it over to Dave with his species spotlight on this. Right or left? Oh, let me get my Down. Where's my thing? Where's my thing? Press a button and see what happens. This is my mashing key. Over a year ago, well, about a year ago, and I thought, okay, I'm going to throw a couple. 
of these in there. I've had them before, but just uh, as in a community. And uh, immediately in about three weeks, these things start reading every three weeks, every three weeks, every three weeks. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> um, you know, because it was just a roll of the dice. I didn't intentionally try to instigate the breeding in these fish, but be aware if you get the right circumstance, these guys are prolific breeders, and um, they will probably breed about once a month for you. So if you like to have a fish that has uh, got a lot of character and will breed in your aquarium, given the right conditions, uh, this is this cool little fish to have. Uh, they are cichlids, so they can be a little bit um, dominant and territorial, but mainly just like uh, last week, if you're here, um, the epistos, they're going to establish an area and they're going to protect it. Um, they will venture out further than that little square area or that little circle area you're talking about. They will go all over the tank, but basically, once they find an area, they're going to protect it. Um, and I wouldn't recommend, although not impossible, I wouldn't recommend having a lot of bottom feeders with this, with this fish because they will pester the crap out of them. Basically any mid-level or upper-level upper fish they're going to get along with just fine. Um, I have Siamese algae eaters, I have, now I have some rams in there, but, um, but basically they occasionally go chase them around, but they don't beat them up like they will with other fish like quarries and things like that. I, I would not recommend anything that forages around the bottom because the, those fish will accidentally stumble into their territory and you might have problems, you might not. That's one of those things about, you know, we've all probably been there where the standard rule does not apply because you say, well, I've kept these fish with other fish and nothing ever happens. Well, that is true, but for the most part, I would not recommend anything like loaches or quarries with these fish because they will fight because they're very protected, especially when they've got young. Um, where's the... Uh, okay. okay, so, like I said, there's, here, here is some, some of the varieties you see that are more common. There are probably a dozen varieties um, that I know of just through reading, but I never see them around. Um, this typically, Penny Otis, I've seen these in aquarium shops. I've also seen private people that have them. Um, pretty cool coloration in there. Um, the roll of fire, I really like these ones. Um, their spots are very bold. Um, Sub ocelotus, the female is going to be very colorful like that. You can see she's got a lot more coloration. There's no albino. Um, and then Sephamothomatus, this one is really cool, but I never have seen this in captivity anywhere. So I don't know if. Um, if any of you have ever seen that, but that's a fish I'd like to get a hold of. That's a pretty cool looking fish. Um, for the sake of time, uh, if you want this information, you can find it online. But uh, basically, you know, they've got yellow cribs, um, Kenyatis, there's albinos, there's also a giant crib. Um, I've seen videos online, those are pretty cool. They get really large. Um, these fish typically are only going to get two to three inches of max. Um, well, my pair is probably two and a half, three inches. They started breeding it like that. Two inches, really small. Uh, so you know that's your that's your varieties you're gonna see more commonly. Uh, but again, there's plenty of others. If you really get into this fish, I'm sure somebody across the country will be able to provide you with some random obscure one that you know I've never seen. But. Okay. So as far as um, diet, um, this is my diet plan, but it doesn't mean it's the only diet plan. <laughs> Um, what I do is, daily, I feed a pellet, just like a staple. Um, so either I'll come home from work or whatever, and I have a little bit of pellet in there, and then later on at night, I will go down and I will thaw out something else to give them. Typically what I do is I go with like a brine shrimp one day, the next day I'll go into like this emerald entree, which has a little brine shrimp in it, but it has greens in it, because they do like to pick at greens. Now, you know, just in a side light, in a planted tank, they typically don't destroy plants, but they will pull and pick at mosses and you know things like that. Um, I've never seen them though just literally chew up plants, but they will go and pick at it a little bit. Um, every now and then, I go with some protein here, beef heart, that's probably the most infrequent thing I feed. 
Um, I used to feed bloodworms, but personally I'm allergic to bloodworms, so I learned the hard way not to do that anymore. Um, so keep that in mind. If you ever get huge rashes, it might be from the bloodworms. Um, yeah, don't touch them. Yeah, and I wasn't even touching them. I was in there, yeah. in the tank after feeding, and all of a sudden just, and I'm like, what's going on here? I couldn't even breathe. And I was like, okay, blood worms are out. And you can develop that allergy over time, too, by exposure. To yeah, yeah, so just keep that in mind, too. Yeah. Side light. And then, <clears throat> this spirulina brine shrimp is, is probably what I feed more often, probably about every three or four days. Um, it's got a myriad of different things. So. These are pretty common in, in most shops. You can find them in there. So what I like to do is just roll this as a variety so they always are getting a little bit of variety in the diet, and this is my staple. Now, you know, you can feed uh, any brand, but I recommend a pellet food, although mine are vor voracious eaters. I mean, as soon as I walk in the room, they're at the top. But sometimes you want something that's sinking because pellet, pellet you know, is a little bit harder, and, and cribs, Cribs are going to take it in their mouth and they're going to sit there and chew on it a little bit and then they'll spit it out once it's broken up and then you've got this all over the bottom. So uh, feed sparingly with that stuff. Um, okay, so these are some pictures um, of my pair with, with fry. These fry here are probably about three days old, three to five days old. Um, and again, they're very protective. I would recommend having some moss or whatever, because the fry love to go in there and hide. Um, one thing about, about the fry, probably the first two weeks, they're going to eat, um, oh, wait, do I have to put it? Okay, there we go. There she is hovering, protecting. Um, they are feeding on a lot of this microorganism stuff that grows all over the tank. That's what their main diet is. Don't worry about feeding these guys, these fry, for at least two weeks. They're getting so much out of the tank that um, I don't even bother. And then, let's see where is this one? Click on the right here. Okay, you can see, now that's the, uh, the father now. See, you see that little motion he's doing there? He's signaling to them, you know, get over here. Or, or It's been really fun to watch this. I probably put in four or 500 hours literally walk just sitting there watching studying everything you know we all do but i will sit there sometimes for a solid hour and i'll watch every little movement study it uh, it's really interesting because before i had my tank full of vegetation and i had a lot of open sand they would bring them out and put them in a cluster and i would watch her signal to them they would get up and go around and then they would do another twitch and they would all kind of hunker down and wait so they will signal if there's other fish in the area and they'll all cluster and wait um so you know that's kind of cool thing to watch um what's what's a good tank size for them i would recommend nothing smaller than 20 gallons um typically what i do is i take my fry from when i separate them to do um, Sorry. Okay, and there's another one right there. That's a top view of that cluster on the, on the sand where they're hovering and they're just sitting there and then as soon as it's, you know, time to go, they'll move around. Another cool thing is that I, I have tons of videos too if you're ever interested. Um, I, I got some video of one time when they were moving them by mouth out of the cave for the very first time. That to me it was the coolest thing. It was like this oh, whoa, you know. And it was fun because they pick them up and they spit them out and then they'll go get another group and spit them out and then they'll take them and they'll spit them back in. It, it, you know, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, one thing I would say on the lines of tank size, the fry I usually will take out and put them in a 10 gallon tank for maybe a month. Then they go into a 20. The parents though, these parents are in a 55 and they're breeding with other community fish. You can do that. Um, you don't have to isolate, but if they're just going to be by themselves, give them a 20 gallon tank. But the main thing overall is to give them cover. You don't want them totally exposed out in the open. They're going to want caves or they're going to want heavy vegetation. What I do is I take those little terracotta pots and I cut them in half and put them in there. Or I've built like rocks and stuff. Right now they have a cave that I don't know how they did this, but I have probably a rock pile like this. And 
they will go in this side, they'll come out this side, they'll come out this side. <laughs> so they, they burrow <laughs> and they move sand around in there, and that's one thing, they, there are sand sifters, they'll go down and pick away at the sand. So that's a good substrate for them, is sand? Yes, something that's um, not too sharp, and not large gravel. Um, I would recommend sand, or um, I use black diamond blasting sand, um, or pool filter sand, or um, I think you picked up some don't general purpose. Don't use that. Don't use it? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I washed it, washed it, washed it. Okay, so don't use that. But something I've got, got some sand for papers if anybody But definitely go with a small sand. It's not been the highest quality. It has been as dirty as the place sand to be lately. I've been getting rocks in it and all kinds of stuff that didn't used to be in the pool. Huh, it's interesting. I've also noticed that past couple years. Yeah, I I would say just use a, a fine substrate, whatever you pick. Um, just because they are sand sifters, they'll pick things out of the sand. And, and um, I've got I've got another cool video that uh, is on my YouTube channel where he he was over in the corner and he was just literally tail splashing <laughs> the sand up in the air. And you know I don't know what he's doing it for, but it's. Boom, knocking these big clouds of sand around. I'm like, okay, well, probably just trying to rearrange you know, nervous energy. Anyway, um, but I do, if, you, if you've got any questions, I know we want to get on to this. If you've got any questions, hit me up afterwards or, you know, text me or email me or whatever you can. I do have a YouTube channel, so, you know, I've got tons and tons of videos of them reading and, and all that kind of stuff. So feel free to, to you know, ask me about that too. Facebook products. Yeah, basement aquatics with Dave. So, anyway, appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And just as a throw out there before we go on to the raffle, uh, you know, we try to do a little spotlight every meeting. Uh, we're more than capable of doing the spotlight ourselves, but we'd much rather one of y'all if y'all want to do it. You know, Dave's one of our members, just like y'all. So if anybody ever wants to do a species spotlight, a plant spotlight, or do a, just a little short informational about yourself and your, you and the hobby, feel free to reach out to me or one of the other board members. We'd love to get more people involved. Um, so I'm going to go over the rules of the raffle. I know we all pretty much know, but we'll just go over it anyway. So we've got your tickets that you got when you come in the door, and we'll call out your number. We'll call out about two to three at a time. So wait for your number to be called out before you come up. Don't... You know, don't come to the table if we have called your number to look. Just so we can try to hurry and get everybody sifted through there. Um, so as you call, you get your chance to pick, and then you go on, and then the next person will call. You know, take you a good minute to look, but then, you know, pick what you want so that we can get the next person through. And then if we happen to have anything left, when everybody gets their turn through, then we'll say to come back to the table. But other than that, that's about it. Oh, and um, feel free to talk amongst yourself. Don't worry about being too loud. We got bad voices, so just chit chat amongst each other. And a lot of you can do that. I thought of one more thing about this. I'll leave this all here. I don't know if it's a bad one. I've got the side back. I'm going to take you to the If you see this in one of the sports, thank you. From around the country. All right. Zero, five, four. Maybe the last three numbers you're taking, by the way. Yeah, the last three numbers. <laughs>